Good evening and thank you for joining Medical Channel Asia's online webinar, Doctor on Call. I'm Shan Ping, who will be your MC for tonight. Medical Channel Asia is the platform host of this event, who is designed to be Asia's largest online healthcare and medical resource. It is packed full of specific content that is designed to have your questions answered by trusted medical professionals from across Asia. Let's go straight to the stars of the event. Tonight, we have not one, but two doctors with us, both general and colorectal surgeons from 10 Surgery Group Singapore. First would be Dr. Eugene Yeo, a strong believer in the prevention and early detection of colorectal cancer through colonoscopy training. Fellowship trained in Korea in minimally invasive surgery, in particular, robotic colorectal surgery. Dr. Eugene was previously Director of Endoscopy Skills Simulation Center in Singapore General Hospital, which was responsible for endoscopy training for, practice, for practitioners in the institution. With him is Dr. To Ilin, a passionate advocate for women's health and wellness. She's also a proponent of timely colonoscopy for the same reasons of prevention of colorectal cancer. She spent her fellowship year in Australia, specializing in pelvic accentuation, also known as precise organ removal surgery for the management of advanced pelvic tumors and was also trained in minimally invasive surgery. Okay, Dr. Eugene, please. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, thank you to Medical Channel Asia for inviting Eileen and myself uh, to give a talk to everyone tonight. Um, this month is um, appropriate because it is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month and hopefully through this webinar, everyone can learn more and um, get more information about this uh, very common cancer, unfortunately, um, in Singapore and around the world. So I'll start my presentation. I'll be talking about the epidemiology, uh, which is how prevalent and the incidence of colorectal cancer in Singapore, and as well as the risk factors that everyone can watch out for, um, and how we can potentially prevent colorectal cancer happening to us and our loved ones. This is a graph. Um, let's start with some context. This is a graph showing the number of cancer diagnoses in Singapore over the years. And you can see over the last 20 years, the number of cancer cases in Singapore, this is all cancers, have increased almost exponentially and it's, been, it's doubled over the last 20 years. Many reasons for this. Um, one of the reasons is that, uh, ironically, because our healthcare system is getting better, we are living longer. And having cancer is a function of how old you are as well. The older you get, the higher the risk of you developing cancer. And secondly, because our medical system is good, we are detecting more cancers, both at early and late stages. And that's probably part of the reason why the number of cancers are going up. Um, unfortunately, um, cancer is also the top cause of death in Singapore. Um, this is the latest data, I think, of last year. And um, this is very consistent with most developed countries where cancer and lifestyle diseases such as ischemic heart disease and stroke are the more common causes of death as opposed to infections, as opposed to um, trauma, as opposed to uh, issues like war and um, um, poor nutrition. So in Singapore, cancer is the number one cause of death at this point in time. And unfortunately, we know, I'm sure everyone uh, also knows this very well, that the later we dis discover the cancer, um, the poorer the, the prognosis becomes. So as we go from stage one to stage four, there are four stages in all cancers. The survival rate, this is of all cancers, will drop significantly. All right, at the stage one, you're able to get almost an 80 to 90, even 95% uh, rate of um, survival. Um, for the stage early stage cancers, and it drops down to about 20% or even less, uh, depending on the type of cancer. So how does colon and rectum cancer come into the picture? Well, colon and rectal cancer are actually, is actually the most common cancer in Singapore. And you can see in this table here, where we have the incidence of colon and rectal cancer on the left, and the mortality rate it means how often does it cause death on the right, Colon and rectum is the most common in males, which is the top left-hand corner, 16.9%. And it's the second most common in females, uh, altogether making it the most common in both males and females in Singapore. And unfortunately as well, colorectal cancer in Singapore is diagnosed most often at the later stages. As you can see in the graph here on the left, colorectal cancer is mostly found in stage three in males, and the same in females. 
Stage four is about 20 to 25% of all diagnosis. So what is colorectal cancer? Where is the colon and rectum? Some of you might be asking. Um, so let's just go in back to the basics and understand the anatomy of the intestinal tract. Um, this is what the intestinal tract looks like. And this is uh, our mouth where we eat our food. Uh, the food will go down through the entire intestinal tract and come out through the anus. And as you can see here, as the food goes down, it enters the stomach, the small intestine, part of which is the ileum here, and it goes into the colon and subsequently ends up in the rectum. So colorectal cancer is cancer um, that originates from the colon over in this green area, as well as the rectum and anus at the bottom area. Where in the colon and rectum does um, colorectal cancer occur? Generally speaking, it's mostly found in the distal part, which is the lower part. The sigmoid colon, which is the lower part of the colon, as well as the rectum, which is the last part of the um, intestinal tract before it enters the anus and comes out, um, makes up for almost 50% of the cases. All the rest are on the other parts of the colon, which are much less common compared to um, the distal or the lower colon cancers. And how does colon cancer develop? Okay, this is a very interesting thing and we've all learned this through years of study. Colorectal cancer actually develops from polyps. Um, polyps are small growths in the intestine. And as over time, as the growths grow larger and larger, this is what we call a, a polyp to cancer sequence. It slowly becomes more and more hyperplastic and dysplastic, which means the cells change to a type of cell that is no longer able to be controlled. Um, in terms of stopping the cell from dying on its own. So you have uncontrolled cell growth, which slowly invades not just the lining of the intestine, but it invades into the muscle and eventually becomes uh, a cancer which can spread to the rest of the body. So how does these polyps develop into cancer? Um, this is a bit of a technical, but it essentially is a result of multiple um, mutations of genes over the time. And uh, as normal colon cells, as they replenish itself, because just like skin cells, colon cells also re replenish themselves over time, um, these, these cells divide. And every time the cells divide, there is a chance for the DNA to be mutated. And over millions and millions of different replications, all these chances of having mutations that happen and add up over time will increase. And if increasing this number of mutations, eventually it comes to a point where the cell is not able to control the, the death anymore. So the cell becomes autonomous. It's, it doesn't um, signal to, to um, stop growing. And subsequently it invades into the rest of the tissues and subsequently becomes what we call a cancer. So in a typical patient with no increased risk, uh, we understand that it's a five to 10 year duration from the development of a normal colon all the way to carcinoma. So it takes about five to 10 years for the different uh, mutations of the DNA to add up for it to eventually become cancer. Of course, this can be shortened in patients who, for example, are born with certain abnormalities in their DNA. And this is, uh, contributes to the hereditary part of colorectal cancer. Some patients, unfortunately, may be born starting at this point where there are already a few mutations. And so they only need to get a few more mutations before they turn to cancer. And so they get cancer at a much earlier age compared to the normal population. So now I'll quickly go into the risk factors before I head over to Elin. I've split the risk factors into two different um, categories. One of them is unmodifiable, which are things that we are born with and we really cannot change, unfortunately. And the modifiable ones are the ones that we can change. We can, um, we can hope to adjust our lifestyles and hopefully that will decrease, decrease our risk of developing colorectal cancer. So I'll go to them one by one quickly. Age. So what's the age that um, everyone says that you have an increased risk of colorectal cancer? Well, generally speaking, 50 is the accepted age at which the risk of colorectal cancer increases significantly. So if you understand how polyps develop into cancers, polyps tend to develop probably around the 40 to 45 year mark or in general. And that's how it takes about five to 10 years to develop into cancer. However, we have noticed a very um, worrying trend um, well, perhaps this is because we are getting better at diagnosing, but we are seeing an increasing incidence of colorectal cancer in young patients under the age of 50. 
um, we can see that since 1994, globally, there has been an increase of almost 2% per year. And if you look at the, the predictions of how the, the proportion of colon and rectal cancer is going to increase from those under 50, from 2010 to 2030, you can see it's a huge increase, about more than 100% increment in the number of patients that develop cancer that are under the age of 50. And of course, there are many sad stories of patients who have developed cancer at a very young age. But fortunately, um, if you are diagnosed early, there is still a good chance of cure. And in fact, the, the American Task Force has already changed the screening age from 50 to 45 a year ago. Um, this is not in Singapore as of yet. I think the health authorities are still looking at um, what is the best time and whether we should do it in terms of uh, health economics. But at this point in Singapore, the screening age is still set at 50. But we would do well to consider this uh, trend and perhaps if, as an individual, we might want to consider getting screened at an earlier age rather than waiting till 50. What else are unmodifiable? Well, the gender and your race. For some reason, males and Chinese uh, populations seem to be more at risk of developing colorectal cancer. Of course, this doesn't mean that if you're female and you're non-Chinese, you're unlikely to get cancer. You still will. And if you do, it is a, there's a higher chance that you'll get colorectal cancer because it is the most common. But um, generally looking at our population, this seems to be um, the higher risk category. What about family history? Family history increases the risk of colon cancer. Partly it's genetic, which means the genetics are passed down with a higher risk of developing um, from polyps developing into cancer. And we can see the correlation here generally. And the correlation you would see, this is terms of first degree relatives, which means a brother, sister, a father, um, or, or mother. Um, so the number of first degree relatives with colorectal cancer corresponds with the chance of you getting. So the, each first degree relative that increases um, that has colorectal cancer actually doubles your risk. So if you have two family members, first degree with colon cancer, your risk becomes from one to two and two to four. And with three, it becomes eight. So it does make a very big difference if you have first degree relatives with colorectal cancer. How about underlying medical history? Well, obviously, if you have had cancer before, particularly colorectal cancer, you are at higher risk of developing another cancer um, further on down the road. Of course, previous polyps, other conditions such as inflammatory bowel disease, polyposis and non-polyposis syndromes. These are the syndromes that I was talking about previously that increase or rather speed up the mutation um, chain or rather they, they start you off at a, at, a, at a later stage in the polyp to cancer um, uh, uh, sequence for which you get much easier chance or much higher chance of getting uh, colon cancer in the future. And these are some examples. Um, on the bottom right corner, you have a patient with ulcerative colitis, which is an inflammation of the rectum. And these are polyposis syndromes where patients are born and develop polyps very, very early on in their lives. And these patients have a 100% chance of developing cancer, colorectal cancer in their lives. Now, fortunately for us, this group is extremely, extremely rare. And the other pictures show some polyps, a larger polyp. This is, of course, a colorectal cancer on the scope. How about things that we can modify? Um, diet is one of the things that I think everyone has a lot of interest about. And there are many, many different foods and vitamins and different medications that have been shown to adjust the risk of cancer. But I think some of the two most well described is actually red meat and fiber. So how does this affect colorectal cancer? Red meat and processed meat is a very strong correlation with colorectal cancer. This is the uh, International Association of Research for Cancer Classification Groups. You can see that processed meat, which is the salami, sausages and hot dogs, bacon, all the things we love to eat, uh, unfortunately is in a group that is a very high correlation with cancer. And in fact, they have been given the label that it causes cancer. Red meat, on the other hand, has a high probability, which is in group, in group 2A by the, by, the, by the association. And red meats include pork, beef, and lamb. So all of us who like to eat, it is myself included, we do have to watch um, our intake. And why does this happen is because of this compound, this compound called N-nitrosyl compounds, which essentially are formed after breaking down and digesting both your cured meat as well as red meat. Cured meat has more, which is why there's a higher risk. 
And these compounds, again, they cause what you see here, DNA damage. And DNA damage causes mutations, which again accelerates the process from developing polyp into cancer. And we can see that increased intake of red meat a day can up the, the risk of colorectal cancer by up to 30% compared to a low intake of red meat. How about fiber? Fiber has an inverse correlation, which means the less fiber you take, or rather the more fiber you take, the lower the risk of colorectal cancer. We're not exactly sure if this is a direct uh, means, which means fiber directly decreases the risk, or whether people who take more fiber generally have healthier lifestyles to begin with. But we do see a correlation, and in fact, the increased amount of fiber that you take a day reduces your risk by up to 40%. Uh, patients, people who take dietary fiber up to 40 grams a day, um, which is something like 10 apples uh, equivalent, um, do decrease their risk of um, colorectal cancer by about 0 0.4, uh, which is 40%. How about other things? Exercise, I think everyone knows this. The recommendation is 150 minutes of exercise a week, split up into three sessions. So that's about an hour each time. Um, any form of exercise is fine. And we found that exercise actually does significantly decrease the risk, not just of colorectal cancer, but other cancers as well, and also other diseases such as uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol. So exercise is good for you. Please do more of it. Um, exercise is also related to what we call the, the BMI. Um, how you calculate your BMI is your weight in kilograms divided by the square of your height. And in Asians, a normal BMI we would consider as something less than 23. It's slightly different from the Caucasian range, uh, but in the Asians, it is 23. Anything more than 23 is overweight, and there are different categories of uh, levels of uh, BMI. So the obese and the obese too, and even more. And not only does obesity increase the rate of uh, colorectal cancer, it also increases the risk of cancer of many, many, many other different organs. You can see in the brain, in the esophagus, which is the food pipe, the kidney, the breast, the liver, the ovaries as well. So um, being overweight generally is not a good thing for cancer risk. Um, and of course, uh, many other things such as heart disease, um, high blood pressure, diabetes as well. Smoking and alcohol, I think I don't need to say more. It's generally bad for you. Please uh, try to cut down or avoid if you can altogether. And uh, this is not just for colorectal cancer, but also as for in general healthy lifestyle as well. So the last thing that I would say, the risk factor for colorectal cancer, how we can decrease it is actually to go for screening. Um, in terms of screening, I won't cover that because Elin is going to take over after me to do the next talk. And um, I shall pass over to Elin for the next segment. Thank you very much for your time. A very warm welcome and good evening. And thank you to Medical Channel Asia for uh, inviting us for this uh, webinar. Um, I think the focus of, on my talk today will be on the diagnosis and especially screening for colorectal cancer. Um, and hopefully you will find the session today useful. So I'll just go right ahead and start. So I think some of uh, the questions that you may ask is, you know, have I got colorectal cancer? What are the symptoms that's associated with this? I think some of you may be aware of the common presenting symptoms already. Um, I will list some of them. I have listed some of them here. So for example, a persistent change in your bowel habit. And by persistent, we actually mean symptoms that have lasted weeks to months uh, and not just a couple of days. And when we talk about a change in the bowel habit, this refers to a change in the frequency, the consistency of the stools. So for instance, if you usually open your bowels once a day, but now you have constipation um, that is of a recent onset, and over the last few months, and what you notice is that it's increasingly difficult to open your bowels, um, perhaps you go to the toilet very infrequently every four to five days and the stools are much harder than usual, then this essentially would constitute a change in your bowel habit. Some people may also find that they have an alternating constipation and diarrhea. Now, this is also concerning. Others may notice some bleeding when they open their bowels uh, or perhaps may find that the stools are much thinner and smaller in size than usual. For some, they may also notice that they have this sensation that they cannot completely clear their stools and there is a constant urge 
to visit the toilet to try and open bowels uh, and nothing much may come out. Some people may also get some general symptoms of uh, abdominal pain and bloating, uh, along with things like loss of weight and loss of appetite. Now, these symptoms don't necessarily mean that you have colorectal cancer, but these are what we call red flag symptoms that should serve as a reminder for us that it's about time to visit the doctor. Now, the problem is that these, uh, th these symptoms result in a pattern of health-seeking behavior that's not actually very ideal uh, because it has resulted in the majority of colorectal cancers actually being diagnosed at a later stage. And these figures are exactly what uh, Eugene shared with you earlier in that in this period of time between 2014 to 18, for both males and females, actually more than half of the colorectal cancer cases are diagnosed in the later stages. So stage three and stage four. And again, like what Eugene said earlier, we know that the, the earlier we diagnose cancer, actually the better the survival. So what does it actually mean? So for stage one patients, we get 90 to 100% of them. So almost all of them will be able to survive five years and beyond. This number drops a little bit when we're talking about stage two uh, cancers to about 75%. The drastic drop comes when it's diagnosed later. So for stage three patients, only half of them make it to five years. Um, and for the stage four patients, only a third of them uh, will be able to survive five years. So these numbers really drive home the message um, that we want to get across to you, which is that we want to diagnose patients earlier. But the question is how? Um, I think the answer really is that we need to create awareness so that we can understand why it's important to screen uh, these well and asymptomatic people. And we also need to change the way that we approach a visit to the doctors. Um, so it doesn't mean that you must be sick or you must be unwell before you seek consult. Um, so everyone can understand that you need to see a doctor when you experience the symptoms that I talked about earlier. But when we're well, we tend to take everything for granted. We avoid talks about you know, health checkups and screening. Uh, it's almost like taboo to talk about it. And very often what we get asked is that, you know, if I have no symptoms, I'm living a healthy lifestyle, I'm eating my fruits and vegetables, I'm straight, I'm not eating any red meat, why do I need a check? And if I do decide to go for a check, what kind of test should I be going for? The message that we want to get across again is that early stage colorectal cancer uh, usually doesn't cause any symptoms. And therefore, if we don't start thinking about screening these well uh, people, it will be difficult to diagnose colorectal cancers earlier and at a more treatable stage. Now, what's even better is if we can diagnose and detect polyps and remove them before they turn into cancer, because these are the precursors. Um, remember the polyp to cancer sequence that Eugene was talking about earlier? What we want to do with screening is to arrest this uh, sequence to effectively prevent colorectal cancer. Um, so what I have here is a table that's taken off the Singapore Cancer Screening Guidelines. Um, now, this is what is happening in Singapore. So we haven't shifted to the earlier uh, uh, screening age that the US has done already. So I'll just go based on these figures for now. What Singapore has done or what we have done really is to classify these asymptomatic individuals into three main risk groups. Uh, the average risk, increased risk, and the high risk. So the increased and high risk patients are essentially those with um, uh, inherited conditions. So for example, the polyposis syndrome that uh, Eugene was talking about earlier. We also have patients with inflammatory bowel disease who have an increased risk of developing cancer uh, in the colon and rectum. Um, other than that, the increased risk uh, people are those with first degree relatives in family um, having colorectal cancer. And for these two groups of patients, uh, the screening uh, modality really is with the colonoscopy. But what I also want to draw your attention to really today is the first group, this average risk category. 
Now, who are these people? These people are usually 50 and above. They are asymptomatic, so no symptoms whatsoever. Um, and they do not have any family history of colorectal cancer. Now, the screening modalities available to them are the following three. Number one, the FIT, the fecal immunochemical test. The second would be a colonoscopy. And then a third would be the CT colonography. And I'll elaborate uh, on each method below and briefly touch on some new tests uh, you know, with the stool and blood test that some of you may have heard of. So I'll start off with the FIT. Now, I think the ideal screening test is one that would be easily accessible to most patients, that most patients can accept doing. Um, it should be easy to perform, it should be safe, uh, non-invasive, ideally cheap and accurate. So we want everything. The stool occult test or the FIT essentially satisfies this in all aspects. But what is very important and that we need to remember is that this is used to detect blood in the stools that is not visible to the naked eye. So for anyone who has already noticed uh, blood in the stools uh, you know, after they visit the toilet, this is not the test for you. What you need is a colonoscopy. So for the FIT, the recommendation is to do this test on uh, two separate occasions um, and ideally on a yearly interval. Its sensitivity when it comes to detecting colorectal cancer is pretty good. It's about 75%. And if you do find that you have a positive FIT test, then the next step would be a colonoscopy. However, this sensitivity drops to about 5% only when it comes to detecting polyps. So this is lacking if we're talking about uh, trying to pick up uh, polyps and to prevent colorectal cancer. So this brings me to the next modality of screening what we call the CT colonography. So this is essentially an X-ray examination, uh, an external examination to look at the insides of the colon. So in terms of accuracy, this actually exceeds the FIT. Uh, what it can do is that it can detect polyps as small as six millimeters in size. Um, and in order to perform this test, the patients will have to undergo bowel preparation uh, and this means that they will have to take laxatives um, to clear the stools from the colon before the procedure. During the procedure, a tiny tube is inserted just a little bit through the anus into the rectum, um, and air is blown and pumped into the colon to distend it, almost like a balloon, uh, and then the CT scan is done. So it's, there's x-rays um, that's involved. Once the scan is done, the patient goes home, the radiologist then looks at the x-ray. So what I have here are two images, and uh, perhaps I'll draw your attention to this one on the right first, with a yellow arrow pointing to this lump. Now, this is a polyp that's within the colon. What is black here is the air that's been pumped into the colon to distend it so that we can delineate the polyp a bit better. On the left, uh, what these red arrows point to is uh, an area of narrowing of the intestine, and this is most likely a colonic tumor, so a colorectal cancer uh, that's resulted in this narrowing. Now, the problem really is that when we see abnormalities like this on the CT colonography, we don't have a scope that's within the patient that will allow us to remove the tissue for testing because this is an external examination. So what will happen is that these patients will then have to go on to doing a colonoscopy uh, to remove that normal tissue for testing. So what uh, this brings us to is the colonoscopy. It is the gold standard. It is a procedure that's done in this, uh, under sedation. And I know a lot of people are very worried about, you know, is it painful? Will I be awake? Am I aware during the scope? Um, essentially, what conscious sedation means is that um, you are still able to support your own breathing, your heart rate, your respiratory rate is all stable, and yet you are kept very comfortable and unaware of the entire procedure because of the medications that we use. Um, so I would reassure everyone that this is usually a very, very uh, uh, safe and comfortable procedure. 
most patients don't remember what happens during the scope, uh, but what uh, they will certainly remember is the bowel preparation before the scope, which much like the CT colonography, you are required to drink a medication to clear the stools so that we are able to visualize the inside lining of the colon uh, better. And when it's more accurate, then uh, we are able to pick things up better when it's cleaner. Now, this is because it gives direct visualization of the internal lining, its accuracy is high. We're talking about 95% and more. The benefit of doing this test also is that we are able to remove tissues, abnormal tissues at the same time for testing. So for example, polyps, if we see it, we are able to retrieve it, remove and retrieve it all at the same time. And by removing colonic polyps, this is actually the most effective way to prevent colorectal cancer. Um, maybe just uh, look at the diagrams that are the photos that we have down below. The one that I have on the left here actually shows you what a normal healthy colon looks like on the inside. The one in the middle shows a polyp um, and then the process of removing it. Over here on the right, what you see is the, uh, what a tumor would look like uh, when we do a scope. So again, a pictorial representation uh, where this black tube is the scope, um, and that's the colon, same as the photo uh, that Eugene showed you earlier. We introduce the scope through the rectum, uh, the anus and the rectum, and it goes all the way in across to the right, uh, which is the end of the large intestines just before it enters into the small intestine. Um, the patient lies on the left-hand side whilst the scope is being done, and again, we see another photo of a polyp that's being removed. Here, this is actually a specimen of a colon that's been surgically resected. Uh, and what we've done is that we've cut open the specimen so that we can see this tumor that is lying within. And also at the side, there's a tiny little polyp over there. I have a very short video to share with you uh, about the process of removing a polyp. So again, here you can see uh, the very nice pink internal lining of the colon. This protrusion over here is a polyp. And what we do is that sometimes we have a different color mode that we're able to turn on, which you see here, that helps us visualize the um, lining over the polyp a little bit better. And then we introduce um, this instrument, which is a wire cutter that's attached to an energy device and we loop it around the polyp and snug it tight right at the base of the polyp. And what we do is then apply the, the heat energy device to then burn and cut through it. So that's been cut through already. Um, and what we will do is then suction this polyp out into a trap when we, and then we retrieve it and send it for testing. So here you can see that the polyp um, has been removed already. Uh, maybe just a quick note uh, on the fecal DNA testing. So these new tests that we have, uh, this fecal DNA or multi-target stool test is based on the shedding of the uh, cancer cells into the gastrointestinal tract. So uh, essentially it's to detect any DNA mutation and occult blood. Um, and the sensitivity when it comes to detecting cancers is up to 90%. So th this is very good, but it's an expensive test. Um, and it, the problem is though that it can't give us, you know, any more information than what a colonoscopy can. Uh, the colonoscopy is able to give us histology, tell us where the tumor is located so that we can plan for surgery. Now all this, this stool DNA test can't do. Um, also, we have limited evidence at this point in time, so it's not recognized in Singapore currently. Um, there are some new blood tests as well, but in general, all this uh, in terms of pickup of cancer and polyps is still considered pretty low, um, and there's no evidence for it as yet. But I'll just draw your attention to this CEA tumor marker. Uh, this is a very common blood test that's done, and um, is usually included as part of a health screening packages uh, offered by GPs, you know, company doctors and stuff like that. Uh, but this test is not a specific one for colorectal cancer. And therefore, we do not recommend it for screening. 
what we do use it for uh, is to monitor for the treatment response in patients who are, have already been diagnosed to have colorectal cancer. Um, so I think in summary, just a couple of points uh, to take home that, you know, number one, early colorectal cancer may be asymptomatic. Um, and that number two, the screening of these asymptomatic individuals is actually very important and may allow colorectal cancer to be detected earlier. Um, lastly, a colonoscopy is the gold standard. And, you know, if we do it timely, remove polyps, we are actually able to prevent colorectal cancer. And this is actually the best form of prevention. So um, thank you very much. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for your regular dose of Asian health information.